yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. This indeed is a date that will live in infamy, for it was the beginning of a terrible injustice against the Japanese and those of Japanese descent in America. My sister came running out and says, Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. Well, where's Pearl Harbor, you know? And I had this ominous feeling that it certainly wasn't going to be good for us Japanese Americans at that time. Every president's responsibility is to protect the rights of American citizens, uphold the Constitution, and safeguard those legally living on American soil. Due to the hysteria of Pearl Harbor, FDR used a loophole in the Constitution to suspend the writ of habeas corpus through Executive Order 9066, tragically affecting the lives of the Japanese and those of Japanese descent in America. On February 19, 1942, only three months after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, President Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066. This order suspended the writ of habeas corpus, a writ which gives anyone imprisoned by the United States the right to question the legal reason of their imprisonment. Article 1 of the Constitution states, The privilege of the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended unless when in cases of rebellion or invasion of the public safety may require it. This gives any president the power to virtually suspend our constitutional rights during a time of invasion of the public safety. The power to literally suspend the Constitution is one that can be easily abused. Yeah, we're willing to sort of suspend parts of the Constitution to defend it, and that's pretty scary for people who are different. Executive Order 9066 suspended the rights of all people on American soil by authorizing removal and relocation of anyone surrounding military areas, as deemed necessary or desirable. The government then labeled the entire West Coast as a military area, which they knew to be home to thousands of Japanese immigrants and citizens. It became clear the government was targeting anyone of Japanese ancestry. Posters were hung in the Japanese communities of the West Coast to alert them of their imminent removal from their homes. One of the first communities to face evacuation was the Japanese community of Bainbridge Island in the state of Washington. The people of Bainbridge took their responsibility to defend the rights of their Japanese neighbors, going as far as to publish articles in the local newspaper, speaking out against the unjust internment. I was in the seventh grade when the, in, when the Japanese were told to leave. I remember distinctly the, all the kids that were missing in the, in the classroom at that time. Many Japanese citizens held parades showing their patriotic spirit and loyalty to the U.S. Some even wrote letters to the president telling him of their loyalty. Alas, their show of support did not stop the incarceration. The basic culture of the fact they were thrown into a concentration camp because we, we weren't, you know, uh, Americans, I guess. Amid financing a war and severe rationing, the government built Japanese concentration camps in remote areas spread across the United States. Altogether, there were 27 centers. These consisted of 10 internment camps and 17 assembly centers. The assembly centers were where the Japanese were initially gathered while the main internment camps were being built. These camps were made with shoddy construction, poor insulation, and cramped quarters to house the thousands of Japanese forcibly removed from their homes. 120,000 people of Japanese descent were sent to these concentration camps, called war relocation centers by the government. Life inside the camps was a huge adjustment. The barracks were like army barracks. In other words, they were not insulated. They, all the camps were on the desert. And it was very cold in the winter and very hot in the summer. There's no privacy whatsoever. I mean, five people in one little room. On February 8, 1943, the war relocation authorities handed out a questionnaire. The final two questions threw the camps into turmoil. Question 27 on the survey asked, Are you willing to serve in the armed forces of the United States on combat duty wherever ordered? Question 28 asked, 
Will you swear unqualified allegiance to the United States of America and faithfully defend the United States from any or all attack by foreign or domestic forces and forswear any form of allegiance or obedience to the Japanese emperor or any other foreign government, power, or organization? It was understandable that some of the camps did not want to serve a country that had violated their rights, while others wanted to show their loyalty by serving in the army. Many were confused by question 28 because they were already American citizens. The internees who answered no to questions 27 and 28 were considered disloyal and were sent to the harshest camp called Tule Lake, located in northeastern California. Because of this, some in the camps chose to renounce their citizenship under the Renunciation Act of 1944 as a last resort to show their outrage. After this decision, many realized they had no country since they were born in the U.S. and did not have Japanese citizenship. An ACLU lawyer, Wayne Collins, was one of the only lawyers to take responsibility and step up for justice. He helped them reclaim their citizenship by showing the federal courts that their renunciations were made under duress and were therefore invalid. However, the men of draft age who answered yes to questions 27 and 28 were formed into a special segregated Japanese army unit called the 442nd. The 442nd Regimental Combat Team is the most decorated unit to this day for its size and length of service in the history of American warfare. The 442nd also earned the nickname Purple Heart Battalion for its high distinction in the war and its record-setting decoration count. Despite all this, the veterans of the 442nd were prohibited to enter veteran associations after the war. 22 Japanese-American soldiers were denied their rightfully earned Medal of Honor due to racism. This terrible fact was revealed at the turn of the century, and on May 12, 2000, President Clinton gave 21 veterans the Medal of Honor for their admirable actions during the war. Towards the end of 1944, the internees were allowed to leave the camps, with one restriction. You can leave camp and they would give you $25 and a train ticket to wherever you wanted to go. You can go anywhere in the United States except the West Coast. This restriction was lifted on January 2, 1945. Once World War II ended in 1945, the camps were closed and most of the internees had left. Their jobs, their homes, and their lives were forever changed. So we stored a lot of that stuff we had that we couldn't take in that barn. Somebody just come, came and helped them sell it. It was pretty much all gone. Wayne Collins also represented Fred Korematsu in his case exposing the government's violation of his rights, in which he was overruled by the Supreme Court in 1944. However, in 1983, documents were discovered that had been intentionally suppressed from the courts. These documents prove the FBI investigation showed no acts of treason had been committed by any of the Japanese. The FBI found no, no evidence of wrongdoing. The FBI said, you know, th there was no need to do this. So some white officials at the House Civil Government said this wasn't necessary. But some of that evidence was ignored. With this information, Fred Korematsu and his legal team reopened the case, and he was exonerated. The legislation that I am about to sign provides for a restitution payment to each of the 60,000 survivors. Forty years after World War II ended, President Reagan issued an apology letter and $20,000 to each individual who had been incarcerated in the camps, along with a televised public redress, as a result of political pressure in the lobbying efforts of the Japanese. Today's global war on terror could at any moment be categorized as invasion of the public safety and used as an excuse to repeat history and suspend our rights. It took too long to right the wrong done to the Japanese during World War II. This chapter in American history shows how delicate our rights are and how crucial the president's responsibility is to protect the Constitution. Our responsibility as citizens is to stand up when we see our rights being taken away unjustly. But when the government has the power to keep us from standing up, who can stop them from suspending our rights again? <laughs>